Well, uh, hello and welcome to this uh, Richard M. Karp Distinguished Lecture. Uh, my name is Peter Bartlett. I'm the Associate Director of the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing. Uh, thanks for joining us. We established the Richard M. Karp series to celebrate the role of Simons Institute founding director Dick Karp um, in establishing the field of theoretical computer science, uh, formulating central problems and contributing amazing results in the areas of computational complexity and algorithms. Um, the series features visionary leaders in TCS and is geared towards a broad scientific audience. We're grateful to the many contributors to the Richard M. Karp Fund who've, who've made this series possible. So I'm delighted to welcome our speaker today, Lenka Stevarova. Lenka is a researcher at CNRS working in the Institute of Theoretical Physics in CEA uh, Paris, Saclay. She has a background in physics and is famous for the application of methods of statistical physics to problems in machine learning and signal processing in inference and, and optimization. Uh, Link is the recipient of the CNRS bronze medal in 2014, the Philippe Meyer prize in theoretical physics in 2016 and the Irene Joliot Curie prize in uh, 2018. The talk today is entitled insights on gradient based algorithms in high dimensional learning. So please join me in welcoming Lenka Stevarova. Thank you, Peter. And I will share my screen so that you see the slides I prepared. And I'm really, really honored to be giving this lecture, especially given the influence that uh, you know, being part of one of the programs at Simons Institute four years ago, it had on my career and I enjoyed it so immensely. And it's, it's amazing what the Simons Institute is doing. So first thing I should do is to correct my affiliation. So it's only a second seminar I'm giving and a third week I'm spending at my new affiliation that is EPFL. So not anymore in France, but in a neighboring country, Switzerland. And I will be telling you about work that I, you know, I have, I have recently did a lecture in the Simons Institute bootcamp for the program of this semester where Kind of a lot of the works that seemed like a statistical physics voodoo maybe 20 years ago actually have been established rigorously and part of the program is about it and it's pretty and it's very exciting. So for this very special lecture, I decided to go back to results from physics where most of it is not established rigorously and is waiting for the mathematical inputs and works. And and that's something that was going on in the past two years with the list of collaborators that I give here. The, the main among them are the two students highlighted in, in blue, Stefano Manali Sarao and Francesca Mignaco. And Stefano is among the panelists. So if you have some clar clarification questions or questions, he can, he's able to answer them even during the talk without interrupting it. So please don't hesitate. So this is the list of uh, six papers from the past two years on which this talk is based. And the talk will be about gradient descent based algorithms or stochastic gradient descent based algorithms that you know pictorially are the workhorse of machine learning that is really everywhere these days. So they are really worth understanding and studying in, in more detail. And in particular in deep learning, we have the empirical observation that local or even global minima with bad generalization error actually do exist. There are many kind of works uh, going towards showing like something like that empirically. One of them that I like quite a bit is this, uh, this paper by Dimitri Akliotas and his collaborators, where he starts by interpolating and fitting random labels in a neural network. And then he puts back the real labels little by little. And he shows that the gradient descent actually doesn't go that far away from the point where it interpolated random labels and it generalizes pretty bad, much worse than it would if you just initialized it randomly. So that really tells us something not trivial about how this optimization landscape looks like. And we really need to understand how it comes that the gradient based algorithms initialized randomly are able to avoid the bad minimum. And so the goal here, you know, it's, it's pretty much clear these days that this will, this cannot happen just by studying the landscape that it really what matters is, you know, even the initialization. So what matters is the whole trajectory that the algorithm is taking. So we want to understand the trajectory and these non-convex high dimensional problems. 
And just two points to make to set the talk, you know, in practice, the number of samples is limited. So I don't want to be working in some limit where the number of samples is, is um, unreasonably large. And also constants do matter. So I don't want to be talking, working with, uh, with some rates without log factors and with arbitrary constants. So in order to be able to do something like that, to keep in mind finite sample complexity and constants, I need to make some simplification somewhere. So for the purpose of you know, the work that I'm describing in this talk, this will be on the side of the data. So I will not be assuming any kind of really generic data set. I will be working with synthetic models for data for which we can say something. So the first such model on which will be the first, say, 20 minutes of the talk will be the spiked matrix tensor model, which is an optimization. You can think of optimizing the loss function that is written here. It has two parts. One, so, so the variable over which you are optimizing is the x that is living on an n-dimensional sphere, and n will be large. That will be the limit we will be interested in, high dimensional. And then the way the loss function depends on the x is through the matrix y that is created from some ground through x star plus a lot of noise. So x star, x star transpose more precisely. And it also depends on this tensor t that has order p and is created by taking an outer product p times of the same vector x star and adding a lot of noise. And then the goal of the you know, inference problem here is to find back the vector x star by minimizing the loss function written over here. So why this model? So that also kind of sets again what, what I'm aiming to, to achieve. So this model, because it's high dimensional and non-convex, that's kind of what makes a study of a gradient descent non-trivial. It's an inference problem meaning that what we are interested in is a correlation with the ground truth signal x star we are not really interested in the optimization problem per se so this is similar to the machine learning with neural networks where we always solve it by optimization but we are really interested in the generalization error in something slightly different than the value of the loss function itself and the third and fourth point is that this model has interesting computational properties and the dynamics of the gradient descent is solvable. And this is something that I will show you to persuade you of that. So the statistical physics must come at some point in, and this is where it does. So it just rewrite the same model with the noises of the, with the variances of the two Gaussian noises that I considered just rescaled a little differently the way we usually do in physics. And then I take this loss function that was sum of two squares and develop the squares and realize that some terms just don't depend on the x over which I'm optimizing. And some terms depend on it in a trivial way. If the x lives on the sphere, they're just equal to some constant. So the only non-trivial term that matters is the term here that I called h of x, that if I look back in statistical physics is exactly the Hamiltonian of something that is called the spherical mixed P-spin glass. So those in the audience that know about spin glasses have seen this model because that's the one, one of those that is most often studied in the field of uh, statistical physics of disordered systems. And so what we will be, so, so we will be using that, but what we'll be interested in is at one hand, the you know when I say gradient-based algorithms, I will be speaking at this in this part about mainly two. One of them will be the Langevin algorithm with the aim of actually estimating the ground true x star in a base optimal way, which would be done by writing the posterior measure and computing its marginals. And this corresponds to writing the Boltzmann measure of the corresponding statistical physics problems and sampling it at temperature one. And that's exactly what the Langevin algorithm aims at. And the second estimator I will be looking at is the kind of more common one, maximum likelihood estimator, that is comp computing the minimizer of that loss function of the, or the ground state of the statistical physics model. And that's what the gradient descent or flow aims at. So just to 
get a little bit more familiar with this model. So if you listened to the bootcamp lecture, you would, you know, we, we told you about a set of tools that you can use to actually describe what's happening in a model such as this one from the point of view of information theory, what is possible statistically, and from the point of view of approximate message passing algorithm, which ends up to be the best we know for this type of problem. And this phase diagram summarizes of what's going on. So I will just explain it. And then in this talk, we are interested what the gradient descent is doing. So that will be the new part. So on the axis here, we have the variances of the noises. Delta two is the noise added to the matrix. And delta P is the noise added to the tensor. So the bigger the noise, the harder this inference problem will be. And for instance, if the delta P was infinity, that would be effectively as if the tensor was not there. It's not giving you any information. So in that case, you are in the case of spiked matrix factorization that is problem widely studied in statistics. And you know, it has the BBP phase transition and that's precisely what the value lambda two equal to one corresponds to. So that's what distinguishes the phase where the spike is impossible to uh, recover from the easy phase where if you only had the matrix, you recover the spike simply by spectral methods looking at the spectrum of the matrix. Then if the matrix was not there, that is that delta two would be infinity, one over delta two would be zero. Then you only have the spiked tensor model, which you know information theoretically is solvable at, at some point uh, highlighted with the red uh, line here. But even if the noise is smaller than that, it's algorithmically hard. And it's also a problem that have been studied. So in order to make the the, the kind of computational question more interesting, I mix them. And if I mix them, then you see what's going on. There is this algorithmically hard phase appearing that we believe cannot be entered by any polynomial algorithm. That's a conjecture. And now all I want to be telling you about how is how gradient descent and Langevin dynamics fits in this diagram. You know, does it do as good as the approximate message passing? Does it do worse? Why? So to define what I mean by you know, more precisely was the Langevin algorithm and the gradient flow. It's simply the derivative. So I will be working with the continuous time version here because that's the one that I know how to analyze. So it's the time derivative of the X that's the variable over which I am optimizing is simply equal to minus the gradient of the Hamiltonian or the loss function plus a term that corresponds to wave decay or spherical constraint it would be called in physics, plus noise that either is there and has a covariance proportional to a constant that is called temperature in physics. And if that constant T is equal to one, then this is the Langevin algorithm that is guaranteed at exponentially large times to sample the Boltzmann measure and to solve the problem uh, optimally. But we will not be looking at exponentially large times because that's untractable our question will be what happens at tractable time. So that will be constant on constant times logarithm of the dimension or something of that kind so that you know, we can wait for such a long time. And then if we simply don't put this additional noise there, so this constant T is zero, then this is the gradient flow. So, so going, you know, how, how, how that model is solvable. So in statistical physics of disordered systems, this, this work cited here is very well known. It's basically the reference work that we have in physics to understand what's going on in materials such as structural glasses. And it so happens that this work actually looked at a model very much related to the one we are studying here. It's, it's exactly the same one, except that it didn't have this ground truth vector X star. So it's exactly the same loss function, but the tensor and the matrix is created without this ground truth planted in. But that's, you know, that's, a, that's a complication of the model that can be worked out. And you know, this theory from this paper can be generalized. And this is what we did. I will not be going into details of the, of the derivation that would be very lengthy, but if you're interested in the details, actually just um, two months ago, there has been a wonderful lecture by uh, my co-author Pierre Francesco Urbani that you can watch at the at the Lesuge website. 
So this dynamical mean field theory that describes in a closed form what the gradient flow or the Langevin algorithm I have the two versions here is doing is a set of equations that close on three parameters. This function C of two times, that is a correlation function. This function C bar of one time, that is a correlation of where the gradient flow is at the given time and the ground true vector X star and a so-called response function, R of again, two parameters. And in the limit when the size of the system goes to infinity, these functions in the algorithm evolve following this set of you know, pretty ugly looking equations. But the kind of important thing here is that we started with a high dimensional problem the n corresponds to the high dimension was very large. And the closed equations that we wrote, they are just on scalar variables these functions corresponding to two times, but the dimension is not there anymore. So we describe the complicated high dimensional dynamics with the effective set of equations that are just color equations. And so since they are you know, scalar, they're also simple to solve. So we can plug them in, in, in a computer program and solve them. And yeah, I will be I will be going through several open problems during the talk. So the first one of them is you know proof that the dynamics, gradient flow and Langevin dynamics in this model indeed follows these equations. And there has been a related work in the past where you know this proof has been done, but again for the version where there is not the spike, so the equations are not are not exactly the same. So this you know this is something that is quite probably not so complicated to, to generalize these proofs, including this, this pipe. But it hasn't been done yet, so I will not be talking about that. Instead, I will be talking about what happens if we solve these equations. What insight can we get about the behavior of this optimization problem? So this is depicted here. So as a function of the iteration time, I am plotting the correlation with the ground truth. And at the, I start randomly, so at the beginning it's zero, and then it is growing, event or not, but here it is growing. And depending on the value of the noise, so there's the delta P here, so darker line here is larger delta P, so larger noise is harder. And indeed you are seeing that when it goes up, the value at which it saturates is lower for the larger noise. So that's intuitive, to be lower correlation because it's higher noise, so it's a harder problem. But what's not intuitive is that it actually, for larger noise, the correlation, the good correlation with the ground truth is attained earlier. Whereas for smaller values of the noise, it takes longer to find it. So this is non intuitive. Ne nevertheless, this is what is happening here. That's the property of the Langev algorithm in this problem. And in the inset, I'm just comparing to the very same lines for the approximate message passing algorithm, which is another iterative, but not gradient based algorithm. That one, that one behaves in the intuitive way. The easier ones get there earlier, but not for the Langevin. So if I collect this information, I can actually extrapolate the value of the noise at which the time to get a good correlation would diverge. And if I plot in the phase diagram I showed before where this happens, I actually get that the easy regime that is easy for the other algorithms, say approximate message passing, has actually part the one that is colored uh, orange green here, that is hard for the Langev algorithm, where the Langev algorithm, you run it full time that is some um, proportional to the dimension, maybe with some polylog factors, and it's still stuck at completely zero correlation with the ground truth. And then if you're above this line where it is really only green, then it reaches the optimal correlation. So you can do exactly the same thing for the gradient flow. And you will get you know, another curve in this phase diagram, which is a bit higher. So the fact that it is higher is expected because this is a high dimensional problem with a lot of noise. The maximum likelihood estimator here is not optimal. The optimal one is the one that samples the posterior. So in a sense, by running the gradient flow, we are aiming to solve the wrong problem. So no wonder that we do a bit worse. So that's not surprising, but uh, you know, it's a, it's a non-trivial curve in this diagram. So can we explain it? Can we kind of understand intuitively where it comes from? 
So kind of the popular explanation of why for some parameters the gradient flow would be working and why for others it will not be working will be kind of this, this uh, cartoon with uh, spurious local minima that either are there or are not there. So if there are no spurious local minima, then the gradient flow has basically no choice than to, good for the good one, than to go for the good one. And if there are spurious local minima, then, the, then it's a high dimensional problem. There will typically be exponentially many of them. So the intuition is that it will just fall into one of the exponentially many and not the good one. So in this model, this is actually, the model is so kind of basic that we can, we have access to actually counting exactly how many minima they are at the given value of the energy of the loss. And this is done by the so-called cuts rise approach. And so here, again, I'm not giving the derivation here, just the, the resulting formula that is telling us of, you know, the, the entropy is always number of something that is exponentially numerous. So it's the logarithm divided by the size of the system and it's number of what? It's number of the local minima that have a given correlation with the ground truth as the parameter M at a given value of the loss corresponding to the matrix E2 and corresponding to the tensor EP. And again, this is a result, you know, resulting from a series of works where these kind of methods were developed. So here, what I'm showing you is the annealed entropy that is the expectation of the, of, of the number of those minima, but actually at zero correlation with the ground truth, this also is the, is the quench. So is also the expectation of the logarithm. So we actually know when they are and when they are not spruce locally minima. And if we collect it from this formula, back to my phase diagram, we are getting the purple line here. So the purple line means that above it, with high probability, the only minima that is there is the one that correlates with the signal. And below it, there are exponentially many spruce local minima not correlating with the signal. And yet you see that these are not the same lines as the one starting from which the gradient flow is working. So there is a region between the purple and the green line where there are exponentially many spurious local minima with no correlation to the signal, yet the gradient flow happily manages to ignore them and finds the good one. So how is this possible? So to understand how is this possible in this model, we need to dig a little bit more into what is happening with the algorithm. And we actually uh, can look at the, at the following plot that is showing us how does the loss function, the E on the y-axis change as we iterate as a function of the iteration time T. And we find out that either for a high value of the noises, the dynamics is stuck at some value of the loss that seems to be you know, pretty flat starting from some time about 100, 200 here or it's actually stuck at that value, but then somehow escapes from it and reaches good correlation with the signal. That is the dashed line, that's the, that's the magnetization. And when we actually investigate whether that value at which it is stuck corresponds to something, we find that yes, that it interestingly corresponds to the value of the loss that it would reach if the signal was not at all there, if the, if the X star was not in the, in the model, so just to the non-planted model. And this is a value of, um, of uh, energy that was studied a lot in physics that has a name, that's the threshold energy. And studying the non-planted system, we actually can compute that value. So, so here we make a hypothesis. We say, okay, let's assume that the dynamics goes to this threshold energy. And then what matters is whether the minima that lie at the typical ones that lie at that energy, not lower one, not higher one, that one, whether those are stable or not towards the signal. And that stability decides whether you, get, you stay there or whether you go to uh, gain some correlation with the signal. And what I'm saying in words here, we can actually put into equations. So here, the first equation is where about are the threshold states? And the second equation is telling us, you know, derive both from the cuts rise approach and directly also from the dynamical mean field theory, but again, the details are not shown here, is the condition 
for uh, the lowest eigenvalue of the corresponding Hessian of the minima being having an eigenvector that points towards the signal or does not. So if I put these two together, I actually get a, the, the third expression here, a conjecture for where is the line above which the gradient descent or Langevin dynamics, depending on what the parameter t here will work. And so this leads me to the following conjecture. It, uh, you know, the conjecture is that gradient flow with random initialization finds, in, you know, in time that is, uh, it finds the optimal correlation with the signal in time that is proportional to the, to the input size, which is n to the power p times some polynomial of log n, uh, finds the optimal solution. And if the noise is bigger than that, then it does not. And if I plot uh, this expression into the, so, so again, open problem, prove this conjecture. And if I plot this expression into my phase diagram, that is the blue line, you see that that one is perfectly agreeing with the points that I got previously by numerically solving this integral differential dynamic mean field equation. So, so this, this seems to be explaining whether or not the gradient flow work, works. And I can do exactly the same thing, just plug T1 instead of zero in the same expression and get the same result for the Langevin algorithm. That has an interesting point that actually the line that corresponds to this, uh, to this uh, threshold, it, satur it, it reaches the line lambda two equal one at, uh, sorry, delta two equal one at delta P equal two. So there is a three critical point. So if delta P is bigger than two, there is no Langevin hard face anymore. But maybe let's go back to this popular explanation. What was wrong with that, you know, absence or presence of the spurious local minima? At least in this particular model, the correct explanation based on the landscape and kind of intuition about how the landscape looks like is the following one. It's not the presence or absence of spurious local minima, nor their number. What it really is, is the fact that the dynamics goes to the highest lying uh, minima that happens to be the threshold state. And what decides whether it finds the solution or not is whether these high lying states have a negative um, direction in the, in the Hessian towards the solution or not. And if they do, then the algorithm goes to the solution, even though there still may be exponentially many spurious local minima at lower energies, so they're not really spurious because the gradient flow just never ever sees them with probability that is that is one up to some exponentially small factor. So here I should be about in the middle of the talk, and I want to conclude about the spike matrix model. So I showed you, you know, this is I think the first time that we have a closed form conjecture for the threshold of what gradient based algorithm is able to do, you know, including the constant in a high dimensional non convex inference problem. And the question would be, you know, can we apply the same uh, methodology to something that looks more like a supervised neural network, simple one. We also show that the gradient flow is worse than the Langevin algorithm that itself is expected, but they are both worse than the approximate message passing. There is quite a considerable gap. So is there some generic kind of a strategy that we, that we can make them work as well as the approximate message passing, or at least closer? So that would be question related to the second point. And, question and the third point is I showed you that gradient flow sometimes work even when the spurious local minima are present. We showed that using the Castres approach, but what about stochastic gradient descent? So far I was only talking about gradient, no stochastic. So actually a year ago, I would have stopped here and say that we don't know the, 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 the green questions would be open, but today actually I do have an answer to each of them. So I will start with the first one. So is the same methodology applicable to some simple neural networks? And in statistical physics, when we you know, set up a model for a data so that we can keep track of constants and, and not only rates and finite sample complexity, the kind of popular model in which something like that uh, can be done, at least in simple neural networks, is this teacher-student setting. 
So now I'm switching the mall. No more uh, spiked matrix tensor mall in the talk. Now I'm going towards this teacher-student neural networks where at the input, I put IID data, not only IID sample from sample, but also the components of every sample are IID. So that's of course, you know, not real data do not like look like that, but that's part of the simplifying assumptions here. Then I take a neural network, like for instance, the one here, I generate the weights of the neural network in some, again, random way. I let this teacher neural network generate the labels Y using those ground true weights W star. And then I hide the W stars. I never show to the student network the W stars. I just show to the student network as traditionally the set of samples X and Y. And I will have N samples. Each sample will live in dimension P. So before P was the order of the tensor, now P will be the dimension till the end of the talk. And then the student may or may know, not know the architecture of the teacher network. I will actually be telling you about both cases in this talk. And the question is, what is the generalization error that the gradient descent is reaching depending on the number of samples that it got from the teacher? So this is a setting of a neural network that have been studied in physics for 30 years. Kind of the most common example would be this teacher-student perceptor model, where the nonlinearity that the teacher is using is just a sign. But with just a sign and no constraints on the weights W, this becomes a convex optimization problem. So today we are interested in intrinsically non-convex optimization problems. So in order to make it more interesting and intrinsically non-convex, we will actually be looking today at the phase retrieval where the teacher, instead of using a sign, uses an absolute value on the scalar product of the samples and the ground true weight or the teacher weights W star. So the labels here will not be just binary. This, we will be looking at this regression problem. The data will be generated as is written here. That the input is Gaussian. The labels are obtained as absolute value of the of the scalar product, and the the neural network then sees the set of samples and tries to regress the uh, y or the x on the y. And so, what do we know again? Again, without uh, yet talking about gradient descent, what do we know about this problem information theoretically and in terms of the approximate message passing? That also here is conjectured to be made the best of the of the polynomial algorithms. So here I'm showing you the, the mean square error of recovering the W star, which is you know, very related to the generalization error, just at this plot, as a function of the alpha, which is the ratio between the number of samples and the dimension. And both number of samples and dimension are large. I mean, the high dimension limit, and the ratio is some small constant here, you know, between 0 0.3 and 1.2. So information theoretically, the generalization error can be zero start as long as soon as you have more samples than, um, than is the dimension in this problem that corresponds to the orange line. Now, algorithmically, you need slightly more samples than the dimension, about 13% more, for the approximate message passing to work and be able to generalize perfectly in this problem. So, now we will be looking at what gradient descent does and how it compares to to what to, to this. So gradient descent on which loss which loss function so corresponding to the phase retrieval the natural loss function is the one I write here that would correspond to in a sense to 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 neural network with no hidden variable one hidden variable with quadratic activation function. So that's a natural. You know I just squared the uh, labels and instead of putting absolute value I put a square here. And then I'm looking at the, the performance of the gradient flow. So just to you know, set up the stage of what is known and what kind of we can expect. So I, as I said, if, if ignoring gradient descent, we know that starting from one, the problem is solvable information theoretically and starting from 1.13 by some very adapted uh, algorithm to this problem. For the gradient flow, what we know is, is this work that, that popped here that rigorously shows that randomly initialized gradient descent will need uh, will need the dimension times some polynomial of the log of the dimension samples in order to be able to solve the problem. So there is quite a big gap between like 1.13 and poly 
uh, alpha dot is 1.13 and alpha dot is some polynomial of logarithm of the dimension. So as a physicist, we always you know, try to look numerically what's actually going on. So numerically, if we are looking what's the fraction of success of gradient descent in terms of solving this problem, as the dimension is growing, so here the capital N is actually the, what I call the P is the dimension. So we are seeing that at alpha that is around six or seven, it's already solving the problem almost always. So, so can we understand that a bit more theoretically, not just running the gradient descent? That's of course nice, but that's, that's not just satisfactory. So we take lessons from the spiked two plus p spin model that I showed you, and we kind of ask ourselves, okay, could it be could it be happening similarly as there? Could it be that the gradient flow first goes to the threshold states, and then what matters is a kind of BVP like transition of the Hessian of these threshold states that drives the success versus failure? And we just test this numerically whether it looks like true. And it actually does in the sense that if we look at the non-planted phase retrieval, that would be the right-hand side here that defines the value of the loss function that I call the threshold value. And then if you look at the dynamics of the gradient flow in the planted version, we see that it's quite plausible that it's again going to the threshold and then away from it or not, or staying stuck there. So we again hypothesize that this is actually the mechanism and put it into equations. But this time the equations are slightly more complicated, but we can still do it actually using a recent random matrix theory results from works of ULU and his collaborator Lee. And also the fact that the threshold states are marginal, meaning that the lowest eigenvalue corresponding to them is stuck to zero. And this, if we combine it, gives us an expression of what should be the threshold above which the gradient descent uh, works as a function of this probability distribution of the true labels y and the labels y hat that the gradient descent is currently estimating. So that probability distribution is still something pretty non-intuitive non to capture. But in the, within, the, within the theory of one-step replica symmetry breaking, that is again one of the methods coming from statistical physics, we actually can estimate this probability distribution between the joint, the true label, and the label that is currently, estimate, uh, currently estimated by the gradient descent. And this is shown in this picture. I show, so in the left-hand side, I actually show the loss the value of the threshold energy of the threshold loss as it comes from simulations, that is the purple line, and as it comes from this one RSB theory. They are not exactly equal here. That's not the conjecture here is that this is not exact, but they are close. So, so we use this as an approximation. On the right hand side, I'm showing again, numerically obtained moments of the distribution on which the formula depends and the moments is computed from the one RSP theory and the agreement is pretty good. So when we put these things together, you know, ignoring the little differences, this actually leads us to an estimation of the gradient descent threshold that is about 13.8. So if I put it back onto this axis, I showed you that the numerics, this constant starting from which gradient descent is working, looks like seven. From approximated theory, we get something like 13.8. So we are not sure where the discrepancy comes from, whether it is finite size effects and the numerics would actually converge to the 13.8, or whether it is the small difference between the exact result and the one RSV approximation. So both is, both is possible. But what is nevertheless clear is that it seems that it's a constant. The, the, the polylog of P is not needed. So here is another open problem, prove that you know, any constant times P is actually a sufficient number of samples for randomly initialized gradient descent to solve phase retrieval in time that is P times, times some polylog P. So in the time the polylog P is not avoidable because otherwise you're just stuck at kind of zero um, correlation, but in the number of samples, the conjecture from, from our work is that it should be avoidable and that the true constant is somewhere around seven or 13. But what about the gap between the, the performance of the approximate message passing 
and of the gradient descent. There is you know, still a big difference between say one and 10. So can we somehow close that gap? Can we do something generic that would diminish that gap? So that's the question for the next few slides. And that, that corresponds to, to, to this, you know, when I was concluding about the spike matrix model, that was the second point. So that's the second point to which we are doing. And surprisingly or not, we will do that by overparametrization. So let's still look at the phase retrieval. So the problem, the regression problem we are trying to solve here is still the same. So phase retrieval with random Gaussian data and the teacher coming from a Gaussian and generating the labels, this didn't change. But what changes now is the loss function. So now the loss function that I will be considering doesn't correspond anymore to simple, the simplest neural network with no hidden unit or one hidden unit, that's the same. Now the neural network will have M hidden units and I will be working in a regime where the number of hidden units is bigger than the dimension P. So this is an overparametrized two-layer neural network I will be optimizing over the weights of the first layer, this matrix W, and the second layer will be fixed. The weights of the second layer will be fixed to one over M or to one and I use the scaling one over M. So I'm not really learning here the second layer, but that would, you know, the, the conjecture kind of is that that wouldn't change much in the, in the overall message of this. So again, I'm just running gradient flow on this loss function with a random initialization. So how does this behave? So this is a wide overparametrized two-layer neural network. Does this solve the phase retrieval or not? And this is from a paper that, uh, that, we, uh, that came up uh, in June with a colleague from UIU, Eric van den Eyden, and same student as uh, Stefano Sara Manelli where uh, in two theorems, we kind of provide uh, some answer to this question. So the first theorem is, is purely geometric. It is telling us that if you are looking at the loss function as I just defined it, then if alpha is, so alpha again was the ratio between the number of samples and the dimension. So if alpha is smaller than two, then this loss function has many spurious local minima. And if alpha is bigger than two, then the probability that the only local minima that is there corresponds to the ground truth, that would be this A star, that is just the uh, teacher vector times this transpose, is actually the only one. So we believe that this is actually with probability one, but what we could prove is this is only with positive probability. But there is something clearly happening about the threshold alpha equal two. And when we, and this is purely geometric, no gradient descent yet. But when we put this together with our second theorem about the gradient descent, that tells us that in terms of this parameter A, that is the weight matrix times its transpose, the gradient descent always goes to global minima. Then putting these together, actually, if there is only one global minima corresponding to the, to the ground true with finite probability, well, then the gradient descent also goes there. So this means that the gradient descent solved this problem by optimizing this loss function corresponding to the overparametrized uh, neural network, starting from alpha equal two. And here is just a little plot that, you know, that shows that just running numerically gradient descent on relatively small systems is pretty consistent with, with that result. So if I put that back into, onto, onto the axis of alpha, I obtain that by using overparametrized neural network, I can push down the threshold at starting from which the gradient flow is working down to two. So not yet to the 1.13 of AMP, but much lower than if I was not overparametrizing. So the conclusion is here that overparametrized neural networks need fewer samples. And this is a quantification of how much fewer samples in this particular uh, model. And the open problem would be, and that I, I really don't know the answer, like is there a neural network architecture, maybe if you make it deeper or overparametrized differently, for which the plain random initialized gradient descent would just need less than alpha two, so less than two p samples. So I think that's an interesting kind of concrete uh, question for this particular model. And 
I, I, I might have time for the third point. Stop me if I don't. But uh, I wanted to mention the third point about what can we say about the stochastic gradient descent. So far, I was only talking about gradient descent or more precisely gradient flow because I was always considering the continuous time uh, version because that's the one uh, that is easier to analyze. So what about stochastic gradient descent? So first of all, a reminder what's, oops, what's stochastic. It's you know, the same thing, but we are taking the samples one by one. So when we say stochastic gradient descent in the literature, we mean usually one of the two following things. So either we mean the online stochastic gradient descent, where each iteration uses a fresh sample and never uses a sample that was ever seen before. And I like to call it the online stochastic gradient descent. That one is simpler to analyze, but it's also less interesting because it minimizes directly the population loss and there is no notion of the generalization gap the train and test error are the same. So a lot of the mysteries about how comes that the train error can be so much smaller than the test error that we are kind of asking in deep learning cannot really be answered by looking at the online stochastic gradient descent. And it's also not used in practice. What's used in practice is multi-pass stochastic gradient descent, where we use one or few samples at a time, but we reuse the samples many times. And this is much harder to analyze. This has much less kind of existing theory. But that's the one we want to look at because it's used in practice and it can access you know, non-trivial generalization gap. And so can we do that? So first of all, the first step about which I didn't even talk before, because it was obvious how gradient descent in the limit of small learning rate becomes gradient flow. For the stochastic gradient descent, it's not so clear what is the limit of the infinitely small learning rate that actually is well-defined. So, so I'm just explaining it on this slide. So if I define stochastic gradient descent using this variable S of t, uh, that would be you know, one for some samples and zero for some other samples. So if I do what is usually done in stochastic gradient descent is that every, at every time step, I randomly choose who is in the batch and who is not in the batch. Well, then this doesn't have a well-defined limit of the learning rate going to zero. It doesn't really have a gradient flow limit. So this is not so uh, nice for the dynamic mean field theory. So we instead define a slightly different version of stochastic gradient descent that we call persistent stochastic gradient descent, where we, as before, have some fraction of samples that are in the batch, but instead of reshuffling the batch at every time step randomly, we actually decide at each time step whether we keep or not the, the sample in the batch. And we, we, keep the, we keep that sample with some typical time that we call here the persistence time, following the rule that is written here. So if we do it this way, then we can take the limit of the learning rate to zero, and it has actually a well-defined stochastic gradient flow limit. So that is the, that is the, that is the dynamics that, that I will be analyzing on a model that here will be um, slightly different, so it's not the phase retrieval the, or the model on which we will be analyzing this. It's, uh, it's just the Gaussian mixture, a supervised learning of a Gaussian mixture. So in the two cluster case that is on the left here, I have two clusters. One cluster is plus, labels plus, one cluster is labels minus, and I'm trying to separate them. So that's very simple. I can just imagine there is some hyperplane in the mid middle and separating them. But the clusters are really noisy. So I, I'm in a regime where I will not be able to separate perfectly. And yet, so, so this will even lead to a convex problem. So that's more for kind of a comparison. But the one that will be intrinsically non-convex is the three cluster case, where I have three um, Gaussian clusters, two on the periphery and one in the middle, but the two on the periphery, they have the same label. So th th this is a data set that is no longer linearly separable. So actually to be able to, 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 to have some meaningful learning, the loss function that I will be using for these three clusters is, um, is, actually, is actually kind of you know, using the, the structure of the data set. And I will be doing logistic regression, but not directly on the data points, but on the, you know, as, as specified here on this C, C my, mu. So, okay. But whether it is the two cluster case or the three cluster case, 
how do we describe the full trajectory of the gradient descent? The, the convexity is really not so much helping us to describe the, the full trajectory. So this will be again done with the dynamic mean field theory, but this time with a little bit more advanced version of it, because for the perceptron uh, case, the, 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 the simple one that we used before is, is not quite working. It's not, uh, it's not so, it, the equations do not close so simply. But the spirit is the same here. We start with this high dimensional Markovian dynamics of a strongly correlated system. And the dynamic mean field theory maps it into non-Markovian, so a dynamics with memory, but of one single degree of freedom. So this is where we lose the high dimension and get a system that we can actually plug into the computer and analyze. And here um, are the, you know, is that one dimensional system, but this is a little, you know, I, I want to get to the results or, or conclude. So I will not be explaining this in detail, but again, I was mentioning this lecture by Pier Francesco Urbani in Lesouche, where he actually derives this equation in details. Peter put on his video. Does that mean I should be concluding? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe so, sorry. You have five minutes. Five minutes, great, that's what I So let me just like, okay, this, I will not be explaining every detail, but let me just explain what this is. So here, I actually, the claim is that the dynamics in this, of this classifier in, for the data set that is this two, that is this high dimensional Gaussian mixture behaves in the same way as the following scalar stochastic process for this variable h of t, t is just the iteration time, that, and the stochastic process actually has several types of noise. So it has, for instance, a noise that corresponds to the regularization lambda, which is just the ordinary rich regularization, but it also has a noise that plays exactly the same role of the rich regularization, but that came from the dynamics that is not there explicitly. So this is some kind of implicit rich regularization that comes from this variable S of T that was the variable in the, in the stochastic gradient descent that was deciding which sample is there and which sample is not there. So that's, that's kind of an interesting you know, interpretation of what this stochastic, model, uh, stochastic process actually is. This is an interpretation of how kind of the implicit regularization might be coming out in, in these type of problems. The second term is directly the noise coming from the stochastic gradient descent. Because you might be saying that here I have batches that are still extensively big, so maybe the noise doesn't matter so much. So it actually does. It's still explicitly there, even in this effective dynamics. And then there is a dynamical noise here that is just Gaussian with some covariance matrix, uh, MC, that is consistently computed you know, for, via, via a set of uh, closed equations. And then there is some memory kernel here, MR, that also needs to be consistently computed from a set of equations. So I put these in very small because you know, these, are, these are kind of um, hard to grasp in just like one minute. But it's again some, some work that comes from recent works in statistical physics and that can be directly adapted to, to this problem as we did in this paper. Here again, open problem would be of course challenge once once one goes in detail through, through what this color stochastic process is, can we actually prove that it is equivalent to what the, grad, what the stochastic gradient flow is doing in, in this problem? And you know, once you compute it numerically all these uh, quantities uh, from these equations, then you can compute everything else, including the training loss, the test loss, generalization error, the corresponding accuracies. This is, this is highlighted in this set of equation. So with that, what you can do is you can plot, for instance, a picture like that, where I plot the generalization error and the training error in the inset, the generalization error in the main part, as a function of the time. And now the points that's just running the, stoch the persistent stochastic gradient descent numerically on this data set. So this is just a plain simulation of this simple neural network. And the lines, that's a result that I get from the dynamical mean field theory. So it is, you know, you can see 
that it is describing the whole trajectory, what is the generalization error at any given time for the persistent stochastic gradient descent. So you see that at large times it is going somewhere, but at, at intermediate times there would be you know, some early stopping to do here. And depending on the batch size and or on the persistence time is not exactly the same curve. And quite interestingly, even the, the orange points actually would be the normal stochastic gradient descent. And the line corresponding that is plotted there is, is in a sense not quite justified by our theory. We just kind of ad hoc discretize the theory in the same way we would discretize to do the canonical stochastic gradient descent. It still seems working, which is a bit puzzling to us. It really kind of, we, we don't really know why should it. But so we didn't maybe even need to do this, this persistent stochastic gradient descent for this theory to, to work. Or maybe yes, maybe there is some small error that doesn't show up on, you know, on this comparison with numeric. So this we don't know yet. And you can you know look at other things. For instance, this uh, this case of two clusters is quite interesting because if you don't do the stochastic gradient descent but full batch gradient descent, that would be this uh, this picture that is of course just a special case of the equations that I just wrote. It has this peculiar behavior that if you initialize, so R is the variance at initialization, if you initialize at zero with really small variance, then after one iteration, you reach the base optimal error. And then the gradient descent is actually driving you away from it. And training accuracy is growing. You know, this is a regime where you're interpolating. The training accuracy goes to one, but the test error is getting worse. So actually after one iteration, you are perfectly optimal but then the gradient is driving you away from the perfect generalization, not perfect generalization, the optimal generalization point. So that's a kind of peculiar um, property of this particular two cluster model that we, that we discovered in, in this paper. And, and you can look at other things such as, you know, looking how different the dynamics is when you are changing the batch size and comparing how the dynamics changes when you're changing the ridge regularization of the loss. And this is what's on these two pictures. So I see that as I'm changing the batch size, the time scale where I start to decrease is changing because the number of iterations I need with smaller batch size is bigger. So that's intuitive. But otherwise, it, the curves look kind of comparable to the ones if I was adding more and more regularization in the sense that the blue ones that is just gradient descent, no, no you know, batch size one, is as if I was regularizing only a little in this case, and regularizing a lot is actually corresponding to the smallest batch size in this uh, in this picture. But you know that's that's just like observing how the how the curves look like. So there is no like formal statement here. So this was the last figure that I wanted to show you and just to conclude. So, you know, I was telling you about this dynamical mean field theory and the results coming from it that is able to track the full trajectory of the gradient descent or the stochastic gradient descent for a range of uh, our synthetic models for the data. And there are of course many directions in which this, this we would want to uh, extend it including all the open problems that I stated. We would like to have more, more math and, and rigor into that, but also uh, deduce more of insights just by looking of what the dynamic mean field theory equations are telling us as a function of all the hyperparameters and the nature of the noise that I was describing in the, in the equations. And we can look at other data models. These are not the only ones for which this, this, this can be written. And we can look at networks that actually have hidden variables and of variants of the gradient descent, the stochastic gradient descent that have momentum, for instance, etc. So this is hopefully to come. And I just flash back the list of papers from the beginning that, that I covered in this talk and open for the discussion. If there is still time for the discussion. Thanks very much. Lenka, that was that was a fascinating uh, talk. We've actually run over time, so um, we probably should take questions offline. But um, you know, thank you very much. That was a, a really excellent excellent talk. Thank you.
So can I, no, I don't see any questions in the questions. So yeah, so please send me questions if you have some. Sorry for running over time. 